Cynthia Levin is an author, coach, keynote speaker, and a rare breed of nonpartisan activist. Cynthia served as a board member for Results and the Results Educational Fund, leading volunteer groups in Chicago and St. Louis for over 10 years. She is currently a volunteer with Results, The One Campaign, Bread for the World, Care, Mums Demand Action for Gun Sense in America, Mums Rising, and the United Nations Foundation's Shot at Life campaign. In 2021, she was awarded the Cameron Duncan Media Award from Results Educational Fund for her activism in written media. Hello, my name is Cynthia Chenyet Levin. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm a volunteer advocate in St. Louis, Missouri in the United States for Results, where I coach advocates to work on poverty issues. I'm also the author of the book From Changing Diapers to Changing the World, Why Moms Make Great Advocates and How to Get Started. I wrote that to be a warm and funny and inspiring invitation for mothers and others to take the next steps in advocating on anything that they're personally passionate about to make the world a better place. My advocacy work mainly focuses on issues of global poverty, um, the ones that overlap with the UN's Sustainable Development Goals concerning poverty, hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, and gender equality. As a volunteer with organizations like Results and the United Nations Foundation, I speak out in the offices of my U.S. representatives and senators, and I coach other people of all ages and backgrounds to do the same. I want everyone to be able to bring their unique, valuable perspectives to their elected officials. So all the work that I do now originally was inspired by my experiences as a mother wanting the very best world possible for my children. Before motherhood, I did think about hunger and poverty, but, um, well, I'd even written some letters to Congress about it, but it wasn't until I had my first child that I really felt some deep empathy and connection with moms suffering and struggling to raise kids in poverty. You see, in the first days of my baby's life, I discovered that I'm the kind of mom whose milk doesn't come in right away. Um, I was trying to do the very best I could and only breastfeed, uh, but it, my baby wasn't thriving. Um, there weren't any wet diapers. And after a couple days, I was really panicked. And I called my doctor and explained what was going on. The little soft spot on the top of the head babies have that it sinks down when uh, they're not getting enough water. Um, so I was really worried and my doctor just said, your baby is starving, but all you need to do is go to the store and get some formula and mix it up and you're, you're good to go. Your baby's gonna be fine. So I, that's what we did, and I was very relieved. I was relieved that I had simple things like access to medical advice. I had clean water and um, healthy formula. So um, I was able to see kind of firsthand how um, quickly an infant's life can turn around when you have the correct interventions, which you know a lot of moms don't have around the world. But for the first time in I was feeling just deep in my heart that empathy for moms without access to what I had taken for granted. And we got past those first rocky days and as a stay-at-home mom, I spent every minute of every day trying to do the best I could, feeding them, even teaching them little baby signs, baby sign language. When I would feed the baby, I'd do the sign for food because I was excited, even when they were babies, to think about their education. I couldn't wait to stimulate their little minds. I also spent a lot of time listening to the news on the radio as I did chores. Um, but a lot of the news was about earthquakes in Pakistan and famine in Haiti and poverty in African countries. I felt such love for my own kid and such pain for moms who couldn't provide. I didn't have a lot of money to donate, so I remembered those experiences that I had writing letters to Congress. I reached out to advocacy organizations to teach me how to do more. And that eventually led to me writing for newspapers and then meeting with members of Congress and even speaking to you today. So I just want to pause for a moment to address what advocacy looks like in the United States, since not everybody watching this may be American and some Americans may need reminders. Every resident of the U.S., even if they're not a citizen, lives in a district that is represented by one 
U.S. representative and two U.S. senators. So theoretically, we're pretty lucky that we have access to these members. We can write letters and emails to them. We can call their offices directly on the phone. Um, we can ask questions of them when they hold town, town hall meetings in our communities. And um, we can even schedule meetings with them personally or with their staff by going to their offices or meeting online. Now I say theoretically because some members are better about this than others. Um, we have a senator that um, did a lot of town halls, Senator McCaskill, that we could see her pretty easily when we were visiting. I eventually had two kids and all three of us would go visit Senator McCaskill where in DC there, there was a weekly coffee that she held that you could talk to her about anything and then get a nice picture in front of some flags with her. My current Congresswoman um, Representative Ann Wagner does not hold town halls and you have to be much more persistent to get a formal meeting with her, which we have done. Um, but I digress. We also have a free press where everyone can uh, submit opinion pieces to newspapers. We can write letters to the editor, which are short pieces about 100 to 200 words, or we could write um, what are called op-ed editorial pieces, which are about six to 800 words long. And when we write publicly about an issue like global education and mention our members' names, it's very effective in getting their attention. But even with all these ways to connect with Congress, relatively few Americans bother to do it. I find that the underlying reason that people don't try is because they either feel like nothing will ever change or they don't feel like their opinion is important enough to share. And to the first point, I'll say that it's true. Nothing will ever change if we don't work together and ask for it. To that second point, I want everyone watching this to know that you have a unique perspective that is worth your elected officials knowing about. And just because a member of Congress might be a lawyer, that doesn't mean they know more than a kindergarten teacher about early childhood education. And it's not just about knowledge. Sometimes it's about what your identity inherently brings to the table. For example, as a mom myself, I coach moms um, on what I consider five big reasons that moms make great advocates. Our children have practically trained us in some of the best characteristics that an activist can have. They didn't mean to, but they just do it naturally. They make us explain things over and over, so we get really good at it. They make us be persistent because we have to ask them to do things over and over. We are forced to be responsible because our kids are not responsible. They're just kids. And we are experts in the most important skills like kindness, compassion, and sharing. And these are basic moral ethics, all things that are needed when dealing with elected officials, all of those persistence and uh, be responsibility, telling stories. But the number one reason is that we are powerful, not because people have been trained to listen to their mommies, which that can actually backfire on us sometimes, but because we care deeply. And being a parent, um, it brings out empathy that can be contagious in a very good way. When I care deeply about someone else's situation, and I can explain it well to my senator's aide using simple terms and a compelling story, in a way that makes them care too, well, that's very powerful indeed. So as I talk and I tell you some stories, uh, I ask you to consider what makes up your identity? What great perspectives can you bring to the table? Because we need to hear from everyone. And when you figure out what parts of your identity make you special as an advocate, that can help you decide how to advocate. In my case, once I leaned into my motherhood, um, I started to get creative um, to engage my kids and their friends um, in my activism to help other kids and moms around the world. None of the other advocates around me were doing this, you know, with messy artwork and kids tagging at their heels. Um, but at every age, I found a way that they could express themselves and they could contribute by making art or practicing their handwriting um, on letters that we mail in, or um, they got to meet members of Congress and aides right along beside me. 
So maybe you won't do it that way because you don't have kids, but I hope my story can help folks think about the possibilities of using what makes you, you. So I'm now gonna tell a few stories about my advocacy to um, bring some of these actions on education campaigns to life for you. Um, but I just wanna share a few facts um, that are meaningful and inspiring to me about global education. Um, for instance, um, in 2020, I'm gonna read this uh, so I get it right, five million children under age five died, but mothers, children of mothers with 12 years of education are 30% less likely to die before age five. That's what UNICEF found. What a wonderful thing. It's almost like global education is like a social vaccine that you give a mother education and it protects her and her children, the, gener the next generation. Uh, another thing that always um, gives me um, inspiration and uh, makes me feel better about the work that I'm doing is that the World Bank found that for each year of school completed, uh, future wages increase uh, 10, an average of 10%. And that's even bigger for girls. It's more like they get an additional year of education and they can get up to 20% higher wages. Also, no other country has conceived, is, has achieved um, continuous and rapid economic growth without at least 40% of adults, adults being able to read and write. Um, you know, we're not, we don't have to go for 100% of people in the world having literacy skills. Even that 40% can cause a great improvement in the world economy. And lastly, if you ever need uh, to motivate some middle school girls to be your allies and to take action with you, share this last point with them. Girls with no education are three times as likely to marry before age 18 as those without secondary education. And I, the, when I would share that with kid, girls that were like sixth to eighth grade, when they found out that their counterparts in other countries were being forced to marry against their will, it got very visceral for them. And um, yeah, it's, it's good news if we can educate these kids. So let's start with a story. And this story begins in uh, 2011, and it's about the Global Partnership for Education and a campaign that uh, results, the organization that I volunteer for, uh, was doing uh, with the GPE. So the Global Partnership for Education it's the world's only partnership and fund that's focused on providing quality education to children in lower income countries. Um, the GPE brings together all partners invested in education, and that can include lower income countries, the donor countries, international organizations, civil society, and that civil society includes youth and teacher organizations, and the private sector of private foundations, all of those get together to transform education systems, focusing particularly on the pl places and people with the greatest needs. So uh, what we did was um, we started very grassrootsy, very, very um, uh, at the level of the people, right? We brought a Ugandan teacher into a kindergarten through eighth grade school as part of a nationwide campaign to promote global education. And as part of that uh, process, we asked the kids to participate in a project with us so they could take an advocacy action. The kids made a paper chain of reasons why education is important. So they wrote down what they thought was important and then linked it up with all their friends. And then we took that big chain and we combined it with other schools around the nation and it got shipped to Washington DC where they used it as a visual aid to publicize the GPE, and we shared portions of the chains with um, different congressional offices. Um, not only did we do that, but we also invited um, the, the participation of members of Congress. My congresswoman was Jan Schakowsky in Illinois, uh, lived around the Chicago area at the time, and she couldn't make it, but she sent her district director and the local press covered it with photos. I had my preschooler with her, with me, so she got to share her opinions too, which was very memorable for her and for the district director. And 
that meeting helped the district director to understand the importance of it and how the community felt. So she granted a meeting with the congresswoman herself. So we got a face-to-face -face meeting where we could make a big request. Uh, as the constituent, I asked Congresswoman Schakowsky to uh, write a letter to um, the Secretary of State, then it was Hillary Clinton, um, to make a pledge, the first ever pledge to the Global Partnership for Education. That was a memorable meeting. Um, my preschooler came along in a pretty polka dot dress and um, Congresswoman Schakowsky still remembers that to, to this day. We talked about it uh, a couple of years ago that um, because I brought some markers along with me and my daughter decided to color her hand with the markers. So we all had to take a break and wash our hands in the middle of it. But Congresswoman Schakowsky is a grandma. She understood about it uh, and it helped her to remember the meeting. Now, the way that this works is she wrote a letter to the um, Secretary Clinton, but her writing letter allowed there to be something for other members of Congress to sign on to. Um, so nationwide, my other results partners jumped into action and got 68 co-signers onto this letter. So those are other representatives saying, we care about this too. Uh, we have 435 members in the House of Representatives. It would be great if we could get them all onto it, but you can rarely get them to all agree to the same thing at the same time. So even if you can get 50 um, onto a letter like that, it gets the attention of the person that you're sending it to. And that's what it did for Secretary Clinton. So she agreed and uh, Hillary Clinton made the first ever pledge of US support for the Global Partnership for Education. And that initial 20 million pledge um, was very important because it gave us a place to start. And every year after that, we have asked for an increase in that. And I have the data showing what it's been like for the past few years. In fiscal year 2018, you know, we we're talking about 20 million at first. In 2018, it was 87.5 million. Yeah and increasing up through there. So I can say confidently that today, um, the US contributes more than 100 million every year to the GPE. It was 125 million in 2021. I'm not sure where it ended up in fiscal year 2022, but there was an increase and we'll be asking for another increase um, in the following year. So that was uh, quite a long and exciting um, success story. Um, but I have another one that I wanted to share. That is about a funding story. Uh, the next one is about sort of a strategy story. Um, the READ Act of 2017 was more about how to make the best use of global education money um, than it was about actually funding the programs. We just wanted to have a better strategy to do things smarter. So the READ Act of 2017, um, what it wanted to do was develop a comprehensive U.S. strategy that improves educational opportunities and addresses some key barriers to children's education. Um, a lot of uh, members of Congress are really important, uh, really um, concerned about this next part that it requires specific indicators and objectives to measure progress. Um, members of Congress usually want things to be very transparent and accountable to make sure that something works, to make sure it's worth the money. And um, it would also require a progress report on global education to Congress and the public every year. So this is a funny little story about how we did our job almost a little too well. Um, by 2017, I had moved to a different state. So this story is about Representative Ann Wagner. And in preparation for our meeting, our results group wrote many letters and made phone calls in support of the READ Act. We had several letters to the editor um, published in newspapers and we provided a lot of good background invitation, excuse me, information to her aide. Now it's the aide's job to brief the congresswoman and research the policy so the congresswoman knows exactly what a meeting is about before we enter the room. At this meeting we had adults there uh, as well as three eighth grade girls who had prepared speaking sections. They prepared very well and they were really excited to share. So one was supposed to introduce the topic and one would tell a story about global education and the last one would make the request. 
and our storyteller was going to share a very touching experience about a trip to India uh, to visit family and um, her experience visiting a school there. She got to talk with some girls who lived in poverty but had the chance to finally go to school. And one of the girls told her that she wanted to go, she wanted to go to school like the other kids so badly that she used to literally dream at night about how it might feel just to, just to hold a pencil in her hand. Um, it was a beautiful story about a dream being realized. But when it came the moment for my child to say, now we'd like to tell you about the READ Act, the Congresswoman banged her hand on the table for emphasis and said, I'll support it, I will sign it. And the look on the kids' faces was so disappointed. They said thank you, but they looked so sad that the Congresswoman asked what was wrong and we had to say, well, they were hoping they could tell you about it first. And she apologized and we backed up to do a do-over with the story and all. And now it's a fun story to tell about a job well done. Uh, because the, not only did she sign, but the READ Act passed. But as with all good advocacy, the story is never over. The READ Act passed in 2017 and it helped to shape uh, U.S. global education policy. Yes, it did all that. But like many acts of that type, it only lasts for five years. So it expired last December. And right now in 2023, results, including those same eighth graders who are now college freshmen, uh, results is working on reauthorizing it. And if passed, it will support many of the same things I mentioned before, as well as ensuring education services for kids affected by a com conflict and other emergencies and um, also strengthening systems for uh, long-term sustainability. So with luck and with skill and persistence, we'll get that done too. I hope that in these success stories, you've gotten the sense that we were very purposeful and strategic in our activities. I have a bit of bad news to share with you. Um, random acts of activity are often not enough. That's the kind of activism that I was engaged in when I first started, because I didn't know any better. I wrote letters alone whenever I randomly had a moment, and I never followed up on them. It's certainly better than doing nothing, but not as effective as I could be. So what can we do? I want to share three big ideas with you that don't always occur to people. One is to engage in relational advocacy with elected officials. I wanted my stories to you today to illustrate how we made great progress when we got to know the members of Congress and their aides personally. It was our goal to be remembered in a positive and persistent way. I haven't even met with my new senator who just took office last month, but I've spoken to his aide on the phone who said, oh, you're the lady who sends us letters on global things. And, uh, I followed up with him so that um, he knew that I'm a real live person and he'll know me better when we meet next week. So it's a great start. Um, my second piece of advice is to coordinate with an advocacy group. I don't personally know um, when certain pieces of legislation are going to happen or how they're moving through the bureaucracy of government. It's very difficult for the average citizen to know. So it's really best to be a member of an advocacy group that has a staff to help you navigate those government waters and take action at the time that other people are so you can get the most impact. Results is an international group. Um, we started in the US, uh, so we have hundreds of chapters around the US. Uh, we're also in Australia, the UK, Mexico, Japan, Korea, other countries. Um, but we're not the only ones working on global education. Um, if you don't have results in your area, get connected with a different organization who can tell you when the best time for actions are. And lastly, I'll say that coalition work with partnerships is very powerful. If you're a member of one group, one organization, but you're not very big, then team up with someone else working on the same issue. You heard me mention earlier, or uh, in my, my I meant to mention it, <laughs> when I did that face-to-face -face, uh, meeting with jo um, Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky, uh, that was actually 
uh, meeting that I did with the one campaign. They didn't have any constituents in the district and I didn't have any results partners that were available during the day to go to a meeting. So when we teamed up, um, you know, we could put together a good presentation. Um, so I think that is about the time that we have today. I want to thank the organizers for, um, you know, letting me um, share with you today. If you are interested in more of these kinds of stories um, or step-by-step -step instructions on how we do things in the United States, you can help, uh, you can find my book in a few different places. Uh, if you live in the US, you can get it directly from my website, which is www.changyit.com, www.changyit.com, and I'll even autograph it to you when I send it or you can order it from any bookstore um, in the US or outside. Um, Amazon.com is probably the more convenient option, especially for those outside the US. You can contact me through my website, changyet.com, where you can also find a link to my personal blog, and you can find me on social media, on Instagram and Twitter, at ccy.11, and on Facebook and LinkedIn. I'd love to see you at uh, cynthia.changyet.11. So once again, thank you very, very much. I wish you all the very best in all your advocacy endeavors. Thank you.